Okay, welcome back. So today's lecture, lecture 23, is our first lecture on climate change. Uh, as a reminder, the final exam is going to only cover the material from the four climate change lectures that will make up the remainder of the class. Uh, the readings, part of the reading, it comes from your textbook, uh, shown here, uh, and the other part of the reading will be a short reading that I post to Blackboard, although I will post all the readings to Blackboard in case you don't have your textbook. Now, early in the semester, we talked about spatial variation in climate. Uh, and to some extent, we talked about variation in time in climate, uh, but this was over pretty small temporal scales. We talked about seasonal variation, so variation that occurs across a year. For the last four lectures, though, we're going to be focusing on changes in climate that have occurred over a much longer time scale. Uh, and, but these changes affect basically the whole planet. And today we're going to focus on factors that influence climate change during both ice ages, as well as those factors that influence our current climate change. And at the end of today, we will actually start going over the history and development of our understanding of how CO2 specifically impacts climate. And it turns out that this understanding is central to both understanding changes in climate during the ice ages and to our current climate change that we are now experiencing. So if we look at a record of the temperature on Earth over the past 5 million years, you will see that climate has by no means been stable. Uh, so this graph that we're looking at here shows us temperatures that have been reconstructed using what we call temperature proxies. So those are things uh, that usually found in sediments that tend to vary very reliably with changes in temperature. In this case, uh, we're looking at oxygen isotope content, so it's the amount of the heavy oxygen isotope uh, found in carbonate in the sediments. And this is something known from first principles to, and also from empirical evidence, uh, known to, to correlate strongly with temperature. Uh, so, by looking at sediments, we, over time, we can get a pretty accurate estimate of what the temperature changes have been like. And on the y-axis here, we have millions of years ago. So on the very far left, we have up to five and a half million years ago, whereas all the way to the right, that is uh, essentially present day. And one thing to notice is that besides the fact that climate has changed a lot, is that it also used to be much warmer. So back five to three and a half million years ago, it's a lot warmer than it currently is now. Um, and then also for the last almost three million years of the Earth's history, we have been oscillating back and forth between pretty extreme temperatures um, as we move between glacial and interglacial periods. Okay, so the climate changes a lot and it has changed a lot over time. And there are many different factors that can influence the climate and can, that can be responsible for how it changes. Uh, we can't go over all of those factors now. And in fact, we don't even understand all of them fully, uh, but we will just touch on a couple that have been very important. So the first factor that can lead to climate change involves changes in ocean currents. And the reason that ocean currents can affect climate is that they're responsible for redistributing a lot of heat across the Earth's surface. For example, ocean currents that travel north from the equator take a lot of heat uh, in the water that accumulates near the equator and they transfer it northward uh, where those regions may then be warmer than they would otherwise be. Uh, so, ocean currents are important. Another set of factors that can lead to climate change and have been very important for the initiation of ice ages in particular are changes in the Milankovitch cycles. Uh, these are changes in the amount 
of solar radiation that the Earth receives or the seasonality of how it is received, um, these can have big impacts on the climate, as we'll see. And then finally, of course, changes in greenhouse gases like CO2 uh, that may accumulate in the atmosphere and these levels may change over time. This is also known to have been an important factor in changing climate in the past. So I'm not going to talk much about the impacts of ocean currents on climate, uh, but I will give one example of how they can be important. So this example relates to the switch in climate in the past from a period where it was relatively warm uh, most of the time to this millions of years of switching between glacial and interglacial uh, cycles and, and periods. So how is that, how did that change come about? Well, there of course, like mo most things, isn't just one explanation. There are many factors involved. But one important difference between the period before we experienced ice ages and the period now where we have those is the configuration of the continents which impact how ocean currents redistribute heat. So during uh, Pangaea, which of course is when all the content, continents were sort of smashed all together, warm water from the equator could easily be transported poleward. It was uninhibited by the continents. That is very different from the configuration of our continents today, as you see on the right, where you get the Arctic Ocean is actually, though it's not completely locked off, a lot of it is landlocked. And that has been, port been important because by being separated from the rest of the ocean, it limits the amount of warm water that's sort of entering that region from lower latitudes where waters heat up a lot more. And that allows the Arctic Ocean to stay cold and that has contributed to the ability of the North Pole to build up ice caps, uh, particularly during periods of um, glaciation. So once ocean currents uh, shifted, we started going through these periods of glaciation and interglacial periods, and we sort of oscillated back and forth, uh, and this occurs about every 100,000 years. Now, a representation of these two different uh, periods can be seen here on the slide. And just to orient yourselves, these arrows are both pointing to the continent of, of North America looking down from the North Pole. Uh, and it turns out that these northern latitudes are very important for determining whether we're in a glacial or an interglacial period. So on the left here, this represents the sort of glacial maximum. Uh, and as an example, this is 18,000 years before present representation of what the Earth would have looked like. There's a lot more continental ice, so ice formed on top of land, uh, shown by the white color. And there's a lot more sea ice, which is just ice that forms on top of the ocean, uh, as opposed to where we find ourselves in modern day here on the right. Uh, the extent of both of these uh, ice covers are much, are much lower, and we have a much warmer temperature in this interglacial period, uh, which we find ourselves now. Now, what is responsible for shifting us between these two very different extremes? Well, it turns out that cycling between glacial and interglacial periods tends to be closely related to the amount of solar radiation that these high northern latitudes receives. And so changes in that amount of solar radiation are responsible at least for initiating changes that lead to us moving into a glacial period or back out into an interglacial period. Us to our next factor which impacts climate and that is the Milankovitch cycles. So Milankovitch cycles are changes in the Earth's orbit that lead to changes in seasonality and to the distribution of solar radiation that hits upon the Earth's surface. 
And as I said, these changes uh, result from changes in the Earth's orbit. There are three different ways in which the Earth's orbit changes, which we will go over, but all of them tend to impact climate uh, because they lead to changes in the amount of solar radiation that is hitting the Earth at about 65 degrees north latitude, so high up there near the North Pole during the summertime. And the reason the amount of solar radiation in the North Pole matters so much is that ice buildup and decline tend to be most variable in the Northern Hemisphere uh, because there's more land cover uh, which tends to have temperature changes that can be more, more radical, and it has that isolated ocean that can cool down a lot. So there's the potential for a lot of buildup and then a lot of decline in the ice, which can lead to large temperature changes. And changes in summer solar radiation, as we see, we'll see, are really important because they can drive how much of that ice gets melted or not. The first part of the Milankovitch cycle involves changes in obliquity, or how much the axis of the Earth is tilted. And it turns out that the degree to which the Earth is tilted varies over time. It actually cycles between about an angle of 22 per, uh, degrees in tilt to a sort of maximum of, of around 24.5 degrees. Now, the reason that the tilt matters is that it affects the distribution of radiation between equator and the poles. And as we talked about at the beginning of the class, that tilt of the planet is actually responsible for causing the different seasons that we experience. So let's take a look at the figure down here below, starting at the left. And these figures here, north the North Hemisphere is experiencing winter. We can tell this because the axis is pointed away from the sun, uh, so away from the incoming solar radiation. And in this configuration on the left, that Northern Hemisphere and the axis of the Earth is actually pointed away from the sun as far as it can be. So here the angle is about 24.5. So in this configuration, during the winter, because the Earth is tilted even more away from the incoming solar radiation, that means the winter is actually gonna be cooler. There's less heat coming in at the poles. Now, in contrast to this, in the Southern Hemisphere, which is experiencing summer, it's pointed towards the sun, so toward the incoming solar radiation as, as far as it possibly can be. And so its summers are going to be warmer than they normally would be. And this is true for both hemispheres in reverse in this configuration. The winters are cooler, there's less heat, but the summers are, are warmer and there's more heat. Now, this is in contrast to what we see on the right, where that angle is as small, the angle of tilt is as small as it can be. Uh, th in this case, in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere isn't pointed so far away from the incoming solar radiation, so the winter tends to be a little warmer. Similarly, in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Hemisphere, the pole isn't tilted so far toward the sun, so the summers tend to be a little cooler. So overall, what this means is that as the axis of the Earth changes over time, the planet then cycles between periods of increased and reduced seasonality. So there's a bigger difference between the seasons on the left and there's a smaller dis a difference between the seasons on the right. Okay, so then why does that difference in seasonality impact whether we're in an ice age or not? Well, this uh, results from the fact that seasonality and how different the season are, seasons are impacts the amount of net ice and snow accumulation that we get. So in general, if there's greater seasonality, so the summer is warmer and the winter is colder, uh, this tends to lead to less snow accumulation and less ice accumulation, whereas if there is 
less seasonality as there is on the right, that's going to favor the accumulation of ice and snow. And mostly this is due to the fact that when there's less seasonality, so there's less difference between the seasons, that means the summers are cooler and so less snow and ice will melt. The second part of the Milankovitch cycles is the precession of the seasons or sometimes known as wobble. So the earth tends to rotate on its axis, of course, but it isn't a steady rotation. Over time, it tends to wobble a bit, and this leads to changes in the direction that the axis of the Earth points relative to the Earth's position in its orbit. And so ultimately what that means is that where in the orbit around the Sun the Earth is when the Northern Hemisphere has summer or winter changes over time. So to better understand that, let's just take a look at what the current configuration of the Earth is right now. So currently, uh, the way that the axis of the Earth is, is pointed, the, the direction it's pointed, uh, means that when it's winter in the northern hemisphere, we are actually closest to the sun. Um, but in the summer in the northern hemisphere, that's actually when we're furthest away from the sun. And this is going to have impacts on climate. Now, in contrast to this, the sort of other extreme of this cycle of precession involves the Earth's axis being tilted in the other direction. And in this case, summer in the northern hemisphere occurs when the Earth is closest to the sun as it, ro as it orbits around the sun, uh, and winter is furthest from the sun. So over time, the Earth uh, and the direction of the axis varies between these states such that it takes about 23,000 years approximately to go from one position to rotate through all these other positions back to, to this initial uh, position that we are now. So one question I want you to think about is currently winter in the northern hemisphere occurs when we are closest to the sun. Now does this tend to favor ice age or does it favor interglacial period? So at this point I want you to pause the lecture and think about which one of these phases you think tends to favor ice ages and why. Okay, so does our current configuration with respect to precession, does that tend to favor ice age or interglacial period? Well, the first thing we need to do is think about, well, how does being closer or further from the sun impact temperature? And in general, of course, if we're closer to the sun, it's going to be a little warmer. And if we're further from the sun, it's going to be a little cooler. So this is true with respect to our seasons. Any season uh, is going to be a little warmer when we're closer to the sun, and it's a little cooler if it's further from the sun. So in our current status, winter occurs when the Earth is closest to the sun. So that means that our current winters tend to be warmer, whereas our summers were further away from the sun, so our summers tend to be a little cooler. So overall, this means that in our current status, we are experiencing less seasonality in the northern hemisphere, which means, of course, we are experiencing cooler summers, uh, which is important for the status of the planet um, and the overall temperature of the planet. In the alternative configuration, uh, the summer in the northern hemisphere is occurring when the sun is closest to Earth, and so those summers are hotter on average than, than they would be and our winters would be further, uh, would be colder because the Earth would be further away from the sun when we're experiencing those cold temperatures in the northern hemisphere. So that would lead to more seasonality, warmer summers. And because of that, that means that in our current configuration, we have reduced seasonal differences in the northern hemisphere, uh, and that tends to favor ice ages because of those cooler summers. So with respect to recession, we're actually in a state that favors ice age, not interglacial periods.
The final part of the Milankovitch cycle involves eccentricity, uh, which is the shape of the orbit around the sun. And over time, the shape of the orbit changes. It goes from being relatively circular to more elliptical. And the shape of the orbit sort of cycles through all these different uh, shapes every 100,000 to 400,000 years. Now, there are a couple effects that this has on the temperature on Earth. One effect is that if it's more elliptical, the orbit, uh, that means that on average the Earth is a little farther from the Sun, and so it's going to be a little bit cooler overall. Uh, but the main impact uh, that eccentricity has on the planet's temperature has to do with its effect on precession. So if you look at the, config at the uh, orbits here, the potential difference in the orbits, if the Earth had a completely circular orbit around the Sun, there would be no precession because precession relies on the Earth being different distances away from the Sun in different seasons, but there would, it would always be the same di distance. So we need to have an elliptical orbit to have precession. Um, now, currently, we are sort of near the minimum in terms of how elliptical that orbit is. So we are in the least elliptical orbit right now. Um, but ice ages tend to favor orbits that are more elliptical. So we're more likely to get an ice age if the orbit is in its most elliptical status. Given that the North Hemisphere is experiencing summer when the, the planet is furthest away, because that's going to lead to even cooler summers than we experience now uh, because uh, of our current orbit. Okay, so that's the Milankovitch cycles. Uh, and before we end this uh, part of the lecture, I just want to stress why, though Milankovitch cycles are very important for explaining uh, changes in climate that we see in the Ice Age, they can't explain the changes that we currently see uh, with climate change right now. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, our current uh, location, if you can call it that, in the Milankovitch cycles actually favors a cooling trend, not a warming trend uh, like we see now. So the changes in the Milankovitch cycle that are happening are not consistent with an increase in temperature. But maybe even more importantly, the time scale at which the Milankovitch cycles affect climate is on a magnitude of 10,000 to 100,000 years. So they can't explain the current climate change, which we're seeing changes occur over a matter of decades to maybe a century. So just the time scale doesn't make sense, but the direction of the change also doesn't make sense either. So that means something else is responsible for current climate change. And I do want to note that even for the past climate change, when we think about glacial interglacial cycles, changes in the Milankovitch cycle are thought to be important for initiating the change from glacial to interglacial cycle and back again. But these changes in temperature that are caused by the Milankovitch cycle are not large enough to account for all of the temperature change that is observed during these times, which is very extreme. And so changes in greenhouse gases are also thought to be very important in explaining how much the temperature changes during these times. And in our next video, we're going to talk about the greenhouse gas effect.